All right, what's up, guys? Welcome to the 121st episode of The Get Down, presented by Digital Music Pool. My name is Cream. Gary W. here. Welcome back, Gary. How we doing? <laughs> we're, we're doing it. Ah, oh, man. Been getting up very early this week. It's a little change of pace from the last couple weeks, um, which happens when I have company here. So, yeah, it's been like 5 a.m. every day getting things done. It's incredible when you have a little time. What I know what we, you can we get went done. to go, we were scheduling to record the pod and you're like, yeah, I'll be up s- s- from five. So like, it doesn't really matter what time we record. Yeah. I was, I was showered at five fifteen this morning. I have some of those days where like, I just wake up early and I can't sleep. My brain starts going like immediately. If I wake up to like use the bathroom or something and it's like, well, I might as well just get up. My phone's not going to ring. Nobody's going to bother me. I'm going to knock out two hours of work. That's why I like to do it. Cause I like to get as much done as possible by like seven 30 AM. Because there's nobody up at that time. Well, not not that nobody's up, but nobody's like, working, you know. So get it's get like the, the little opposite stuff done. nightlife schedule straight up. <laughs> it's nice though. It's nice. It's nice when you have oh, a little man. shit to do. But that's the day to day. That's what's going on here. So up I'm there, it's off. been insane. Before before we get what? into that, up there has been insane. Your weather's been awful. You have like yeah, it's smoke wild shit going on. Yesterday we had the worst. Uh, the worst air conditions in the entire world in New York, yeah, your New York City, Tri City, New York City was like almost double as bad as the next country. I have pictures from my apartment, and number one, you can't even like come close to seeing the city skyline. Number two, it's just like straight orange. It looks like you're it's straight out of a movie. It's wild. Yeah, it's crazy. Yankee game was postponed. It was wild stuff. But it's anyway, no how's joke. Your, how was your weekend? So weekend was strong. I had two big club gigs, uh, Birch and Hoboken. And then Saturday was my first Saturday we talked about at Avalon Mohegan Sun. And nice. We haven't talked to any about this, actually. It, it went how I thought it was going to go with a room that I now know really well that was actually packed. And, you know, that's, that's a layup to me. Right, you know, I could go in, do my intro, do all my mic work. You know, there's t- there was tons of bottles coming out. I think they sold out all the tables, which was awesome. So it was great, man. Great feedback at the end of the night. Uh, it was good. It was a good. It was a long day. We celebrated my girlfriend's graduation yeah. earlier in the day in Hoboken, uh, and then I drove up to Connecticut. And like, I got up there a lot later than I would normally get up there. So my routine of usually driving up the, to the casino early in the day, getting settled in, you know, taking a nap, working on music. Like, I didn't really get to do a lot of that. So it took me out of my rhythm a little bit. But the show went really well. So did you have RM with you? No. RM I I... was on the Cape Cape Cod, Massachusetts, ah. playing uh, Torino, which is one of his residencies in the summer. I thought I saw a picture with you guys both in it. That's why. Yeah, I'm just catching up on content here. I have so <laughs> much content. I finally was able to like sit down and organize yeah. and uh, kind of put together some folders of stuff that I need to get out into the world. So a good nice. strategy, guys, like once a month, maybe go through your photos. Uh, you can go through it on your desktop, like the Photos app. And just create a folder of stuff that's usable for content for nightlife. And you'd be surprised how much in a given month you can actually accumulate. And if you just go through it and you kind of organize it a little bit, for me, it it just, I'm way more likely to post when I have that folder created. After you use a piece of content, do you pull it out of that folder so you don't confuse it? Um... I don't know what I, I, I well, we I use like monday.com, which is like our task organizer. I really use that the most. Really? Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll create a folder within that folder that's just like used content. And once yeah. I post it, I drag it into there. So right. I know whatever's in the, the big folder is usable. Right, right. Yeah, I was just wondering, because that's probably how I would do it. Because I've, I've done things where I've like went and double posted and then had to go back and take a picture or a video <laughs> down. I'm like, shit. <laughs> Yeah, my my social media has been kind of like on the back burner lately, and I think part of that was, as I talked about last episode, just the the stress and the overwhelm from just kind of like day to day and just feeling pulled in too many directions. And I think our conversation was really helpful for me last week as far as just getting things off my chest and just kind of talking through some things. And this week, I've really been able to kind of put some of that to action. So yeah. the first thing I started doing was I created a list as I was going through my day of like all the things that I was doing that to me, it's not worth my time. And it doesn't mean that that task isn't important. It's just that it's not important to, you know, my role in our business or my role as DJ cream. And it's something that 
either needs to be removed or something we talk about that can needs to come off my plate and we can find someone else that can kind of take that responsibility. Right. And just doing that exercise really made me feel a lot better. Like, oh, well, there's like six or seven things that if I remove, it'll open up way more time to work on the things that I want to work on. And this week's been really, um, it's been really nice. I felt really good. You know, it's been quiet on the get down front, which is I'm sure part of that. But um, I've been able to focus on some of the things that I like to do, like growing our business, moving it forward, creating some things that are going to help us internally uh, with new hires and and with our DJs. And like, I get enjoyment out of that. And I don't mind sitting at the computer working on that. I also made more edits this week than I've made in any week of this entire year. There was a multitude of things this week that kind of worked in our favor. We're we're trying to work a, a week ahead of the podcast. And sorry, guys, you guys are always sitting through our conversation, our business conversation sometimes just on the live on the podcast. But we're we're like a week ahead of the podcast. We had some outlier uh, outlying um, gigs that were all pretty much filled yesterday. There's been a lot of moving parts with losing uh, gigs for the summer. Uh, there's been several several venues kind of scaling back, but that that happens every summer. You know, it's it's part of part of the situation. I wish I wish some of our venues could get ahead of it like a month ahead of it and be like, hey guys, after Memorial Day, like we're going to shut down Fridays. You know, that'll save having to move a bunch of guys around. But it worked to our benefit this week, to be honest. So yeah, I, I feel like we're kind of we've gotten ahead of of certain things and and we've been better at it's even doing one thing a week ahead of time takes a lot of stress off of your plate. And that thing is always we're doing the podcast on a Monday. It's going out on a or on a Tuesday and it's going out on a Wednesday, which is how a lot of people do put out their podcasts. But we we've gotten like five, five days ahead of it. And it does alleviate a little bit of stress and a little Makes bit a of huge like difference. Need. Huge like, difference. Like, oh, you need to sit down on Tuesday. It's like, well, maybe Tuesday's not a good day for everybody. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or, you know. And and that's why doing those things, I, I think, will open up a little more time for you. And I think everybody who's listening to this, like, if if you do have a bigger task that you work on, you know, week of, maybe get one, try to work on getting one week ahead of that big task, and it will make your week seem so much more relaxed because yeah. the pressure, any of the, the stress you try there. to jam in last minute is going to create stress, and it's going to create a bit of overwhelm because you're on a time crunch, you know, it, the yeah. same thing I talked about with the content and creating that folder, it's way less stressful to post when you have a plan and you know, on Monday, I'm going to post this on Tuesday, we're going to do this on Wednesday, it's the podcast and all of that content is already curated, you know, right. like, it's not stressful when you have a plan. I think that's a, a great, uh, that's a great way to think about anything that you do. It's a lot less stressful if you have a plan around whatever you're going to work on or whatever task you need to complete, or whatever goal you need to uh, to accomplish. Yeah, like I know I'm coming in for the last weekend of Pride Month, and it's all the big parties of the of the, uh, of the the month are usually on that last weekend. So I've already started prepping. So like I already feel really amazing about what my set is going to look like, what my sets are going to look like, because there's a couple of them for the weekend. So I'm, I'm really already feeling more comfortable than I did last month when I was like, trying to like squeeze in like prep on the plane and downloading on the plane and stuff like that. Like I think being more excited about the sets and knowing like what to expect from the crowd and you know, how I want to play is going to also translate well. Um, I think that's also part of it, but it's that prep work ahead of time. That's, that's, it's bar none. It's second and none. I mean, we we saw it. We saw it this weekend, this past weekend. Big shout to Rendine and Jibs. They did a really good job at one of our venues. That they're not well. Jibs, I know, is not used to playing country music or a country set or a rock set, and he did the prep work and he got ahead of of you know really being ready to walk in and rock the room, and and he got really great. Great feedback. So yeah, it's just get, getting ahead of that stuff is so important. One thing I love to see in our Discord is when our guys are helping each other prepare and be able to expand this, the music genres that you know they might not know that well. So guys are always sharing folders, uh, you know, coming up with like ideas on how to play certain rooms. Hey, this worked. Hey, this didn't work. I love, love, love all that collaboration and. It's a testament to our DJs that many of them are willing to be uncomfortable and play a genre that they don't normally play 
and like just do the prep work, you know, whether that be talk to a DJ that does play that genre and then going and sitting down and spending the time to curate folders. And like, that's how you grow and get better as a DJ. And it, you're, you're so much more, uh, valuable. You're just, yeah. You're just more valuable and, and just being able to play anything. It's, it's a huge, you're more a huge value add. You're right. You're, you're, more, you're more versatile. You're more valuable. You could step into, you know, you're, it's one more room and not just it's one another more feather room. in the cap. It's, 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 there's, mo- if there's multiple rooms of that sort in your market, then it's, it's multiple more rooms that you could step into and play. Um, in corporate life, money? it's like you just went through the country music training program. It's like you spend <laughs> half a day watching videos and like for DJs, you spend half a day like going through playlists and downloading and organizing music and you get your certification. <laughs> I think most people would agree, though, like when you walk into a set and you're uneasy and you have that little knot in your stomach that like you're a little nervous that things can go awry at any point. I always feel like a better <clears throat> set is played because you're really on top of what you're doing. Well, Whereas you care like. More. Whereas, like, if you walk into a place that you play every single weekend, I'm just take, winging you, it. You take your <laughs> you take your foot off the gas, you know. And yeah. You're bullshitting with your friend that comes out every weekend. You maybe have a couple more drinks, and you're just loose with it. Whereas, when like those are the situations, and like when I play a, a gig for the first time, it's always like super attentive on every little aspect of it. Um, and it's unfortunate because I don't feel like that's a mindset that you can put yourself in. It's very difficult to put like, okay, I'm going to take this gig more seriously. Like that's not, that's not how it works. Like you have to be put in scenarios where you're uncomfortable in order to, to execute in that fashion. There's so many factors now that I'm thinking about it, like what can happen leading up to a gig that like goes into how you perform. We don't even think about all the, the different things. And it could even be like how much sleep you got the night before, or, you know, if it's the first gig of the weekend compared to the fourth gig of the weekend, you might play it differently. And it, it's crazy. There's so many factors. It's that's why DJing as somebody wrote, like I hate somebody wrote the wrote online. I hate that DJing looks so easy. It, it is unfortunate because it really does look easy. It looks like anybody can do this. And then somebody steps up who's never done it before and they try to mix two songs together and it's an absolute train wreck. And they don't understand why they start to understand, but that's just the that's just the the surface of it is that mixing portion. That's I just brought this. I brought this up before. Surface. Uh, someone did a study that I don't know. I guess they connected like something to some a DJ's uh, brain, so they could monitor like what was happening while they were DJing a set. And they said that it was comparable to taking the SATs, like one two hour set. And, hmm. and some of us are doing, you know, f- longer sets and multiple gigs in one day. And it's like, you don't realize how hard your brain is working to, to make a night happen. And then one of the DJs is late. So you get a text from an owner. <laughs> well, yeah, that's for us, but just that's think about us. like no, the I'm, average, I'm, I'm, no, the average around. person going to DJ, how many factors and how many things that we're thinking about when we're in the DJ booth what our eyes are doing, what our ears are doing, and what our brain's doing are all different things sometimes. And what our hands are doing. So it's yeah. like the yeah. motor functions, the brain functions as far as thinking ahead and like, you know, thinking about what you're going to play next and not just the next song, but the next five songs or how you, you're you going to handle a manager asking you for this birthday song that's in a completely different world than what you're doing and how you're going to get there and make that smooth. And it, it's just crazy. Whatever requests are coming in or whatever person's just trying to have a conversation with you for some reason while you're DJing and then you're trying to mix while you're having that conversation or taking that request. It's a, it's a million different things happening at once. It's very something that you get used to over time, but I feel like in going back to what I was saying before, when you are hyper-focused, a lot of that stuff starts to get blocked out. I feel like in my like initial sets at, at, at new venues and or getting put into a situation that I'm not comfortable with, all of that stuff really, I, I'm, I'm good at just blocking it all out because it's like, I just want to get this part of what I need to do done. I want to do my job the right way and execute efficiently and effectively. And then the next gig, I can take into account all that other stuff. I feel like that's kind of how I, I handle most of those those gigs. But always that initial set's always my best one. Your first set, yeah. Like your first set of the weekend, or your first set in no, a room. Like my first set in like a new room, or my first set like in a, in a, like dealing with like a new genre or something. Because a lot of times you're jaded 
not jaded. You are um, blind to what like really is supposed to work. And you rely on all that homework that you did. So you lean on like those top 10 lists and those top 20 lists and like, you can't, and then like, all right, well, this stuff didn't work that next time. And then like the next time it's like, well, now I'm just like playing, like, I feel like you take more chances too. That's, that's the kind first of what I'm time. getting at. Yeah. Because you really don't know. I'm going to disagree with you on this. I know we agree a lot, but I'm going to disagree because I think the first time you're, you're, you're putting a lot of feelers out there. You're trying to figure out what's going to work. Who's in the room. This is my first time here. Is this what the crowd is normally like, or is this just tonight? I, I like having more information. So after one, two, three, four sets, I start to get an idea of, well, this is what the bartender's like. This is what works early to set them up for a good peak hour. This right. is what works peak hour. This is where I have some time that I can play around and try some new stuff. I like having more information to be able to make those decisions rather than just kind of going blindly. But I understand what you're saying where when you go in the first time, you're kind of just going off of your homework and your instinct, which can also be really valuable. I, I think maybe it's not the most create maybe it's not the most creative set, but maybe it's the most effective because it's the safest. You know what I mean? And like can you can you flare it in a way, you know, as a good DJ, can you flare it and mix it in a way that sounds a little different from somebody else? Yeah, that's that's probably always the case if you're experienced. Yeah. Um but safe's not always the best. You know, we've learned that safe doesn't always translate to being a being good so all right so let's transition to a time where <laughs> playing it safe is probably the the right move as a dj so we've had a number of brand new venues open up in the last couple months here and we've never really talked we talked about it to our our team in, in the discord and just some things to think about and but let's talk about how hard it is to to be a dj that's playing a grand opening or playing a new room that's still trying to like figure out what it is and figure out the genre and, and just figure out a lot of things. And the things that, what are the, some of the things that we need to do as DJs when we're working those new venues or grand opening venues? I think the first thing you need to do, if you're walking into a brand new venue, I think you need to go in like a week before a few days before and like feel out the room. If you have, you should have the ability. If you're the opening night DJ, you should have the ability to walk into that room a, a day or two before. Like you're saying with customers or without customers? Without customers. Okay. Like, you know, go check out the equipment. Make sure everything's kind of in place and ready to rock so you're not walking into anything, any surprises, number one. And then also get a feel for what the room is. I Because, I, you know, I think most of us can walk in a room and be like, okay, well, this is the vibe of music that's going to fit this room. Whether that's what the ownership wants or not, just have like this idea in the back of your brain. Like this is, this is the vibe that I think would work. And then you obviously have to have the conversation with, with ownership about what the, what their direction is. And then try to marry those two ideas together in creating what your set list is going to look like. I think that's what I did at this one venue that, that we just opened up. I went in earlier, made sure all the equipment was right, made sure I got to see the whole lay of the land and, felt like the I had them do, do the, the lighting to like how it was going to look that night and like really felt it out and was like, okay, I haven't understood what I want to play. And then I went and talked to ownership and management. So like, well, what do you guys want to do? You know, and then we talked out kind of like what the musical format was going to be for that, for that night. Maybe I have a little more access to the next person, but I think if you are if you're one of the opening DJs in the first couple of weeks, have a conversation with either the guy who opened it or the owner and talk about, you know, what, what the musical format should look like in that room. Well, not everybody's going to have access to the owner. So I, I would, if you're getting booked by someone, you want to have a phone conversation with the person who's booking you to get an understanding of what they expect. Uh, because you never really know and until you have that conversation. Because I can go into a room and think it should be this way, and Gary can go into a room and think it should be another way. And the owner could think it's something completely different. And if we don't know that as the DJ, we're not doing our job, right? Whether yeah, yeah. It doesn't really matter what we think. <laughs> At the yeah, end of the day, trouble. it doesn't matter what we think, especially when these rooms are opening. The owners and the managers are the people that matter most. They're going to be super, super hands-on with you. And yeah, I think as micro DJs, management to, to right. the extreme. as DJs, we have to understand, like, don't take this personally. This owner just put, like, millions and millions and millions of dollars into an investment. 
And now that his venue is open, he's going to be on top of everything, not just the music, how the drinks are being made, you know, what the room looks like as far as lighting, every little tiny decision that owner is going to be on top, excuse me, on top of. And don't take it personally. Don't get upset. Go into these sets understanding that it's going to be a little tougher. You know, it's going to be a little tougher. You're going to have to really be on your toes and be open to pivoting on a dime. Yeah. Feedback's going to be, feedback's going to be rough at times, for sure. Like you said, you can't be sensitive. Like you have to understand that the owner has a vision or the management has a vision and, and they're trying to execute that vision and you're part of that. Um, so if you come back and you're negative toward them or you give them an attitude because they ask you to switch the music and you feel like it's not the right thing to do, you still have to do it. You're still working for them, right? They don't they don't work for you. You're working for them. They're cutting you a check. Right. Um, and of course, that, that micromanagement is at an absolute extreme for at least six months to a year, at least. I think it because depends like on the said, ownership, but yes. It's be, six months, I think, is a good a good amount of time to figure it out because it's like the new bit. It's like their new baby. It's like, you know, they want to make, like we said, they, they want to make sure that everything's right from lighting to the bartending to, you know, buybacks to everything, everything, cleanliness of the place. Um, and then especially music, especially when that money is being made between 10 and two o'clock, let's say in, in, in most scenarios, right? The, the good percentage of the revenue made at a venue is made between 10 and 2 because your liquor uh, overhead is, is way less than a food than your food overhead, right? So it, you have to understand that those are the most important hours of the, the entire day for these, for, these manage, for, the, for these venues and the management ownership. Yeah, many times these venues are just opening and they don't have an identity. They don't, you know, if it's an open format, whatever venue, it's like we as DJs kind of have to help ownership figure out like what's our crowd going to be like or what what crowd do we want? What style of music do we want to play? What style of music are we not going to play? These are all questions that I think are worth having a conversation around because it all fits into the identity of the brand and the business, you know? And we've been lucky, I think. I, I personally look at it as lucky if venues have coming in a specific identity that they're going for. Yeah. And then us as the DJ just have to really deliver on that identity as far as if it's a country bar, we're going to play country music. And yeah, maybe we could pivot as far as are we playing like traditional country music? Are we playing like blends and EDM remixes that are more energy? I think that's the type of stuff you you figure out when you have an identity already. Right. Uh, you know, is it a hip hop room? If we're going to play hip hop all night, makes it easy. Like we're just playing hip hop, you know, like yeah. to me, that's very straightforward. It's just the flow of the night and, and how you make things work. Um, but if it's an open format room, it's a little tougher because you're going to have varying crowds every single night where some nights it's going to be more EDM heavy and some nights it might be more Latin heavy and some nights it's going to be a, a huge mixture and you got to hit everything. So to me, having that identity coming in makes it easier on the DJ. Now, once you have that identity or it, what if you go into a place and ownership goes into this new venue they open and they think it's going to be this one identity and that ident and that identity the identity this identity musically i'm sorry so let me let me reframe this if they're going to open their venue they open it up and they say they want this type of music to be played and now that type of music doesn't work how long until you pivot how long until you switch musical formats and whose call is it's obviously the owner's call but like at what point do does like the resident DJ get involved and say, Hey, like this music isn't working. I think we need to pivot. Like we it, could still play some, play it, but I think we should really explore other options musically. If you're the resident or you're the booker of a venue, I think it's part of your job to have these open conversations with ownership and say, Hey, this is what happened last weekend on this night. This worked on this night. This didn't work. Or I think we should take more of this stance on the music. It's working. This, the, you know, maybe what we came in with isn't working. Um, to answer your question, though, I really think it depends, right? If this is a restaurant that turns nightlife and the restaurant's killing it, and maybe the nightlife just hasn't picked up yet, I think maybe there's other things that you can still invest in, like marketing um, or promoters or something to help bring that nightlife along. We all know that it takes a while to get nightlife going in certain places, especially if it's a restaurant first. Yeah. Now, if the restaurant's dead, 
and the nightlife's dead, maybe it's not a music problem. It's just we don't have traffic in the building problem kind of thing. Right, right. I'm going to talk to, about a uh, specific situation that I went through um, because I, didn't, I wasn't sure if I played it correctly. Um, and maybe it's something we could talk out. So I had played this venue the week before, and you know things went well. It wasn't packed, like ebbs and flows of the night. And then around 1230, because it's an a, a older crowd, we saw people move. Because, you know, it's a cocktail bar turned, like, mini, mini nightclub. You know, there's a little dance floor. And a lot of those older people left. Now, younger people came, but I stayed the course of what what we thought the um, identity should be of the place. So that was, like, you know, Afro and throwback hip-hop and, like, older classic. Like, o- just older music is what I would call it. Like, older classic house music. Um Staying away from like Taylor Swift and, and pop and stuff like that. Um, hint, hint. <laughs> we'll get to that later. Uh, so staying away from from that stuff, and it worked the first week, and then the second week, I cleared I cleared the dance floor, and and a lot of the venue actually left where I knew that a lot of it was a lot of younger people that came in around that twelve thirty hour, and you know played like some poppy or stuff but like more back wall like drake black coffee stuff you know what i mean so to kind of still keep a vibe but not get too too pop i knew i could have kept people around with going like uber pop and like going to like my regular regular what a regular set would look like right yeah ownership came down later on and they like 1 30 and i was like listen around 12 30 this is what happened i kind of cleared the place out but it was a lot of younger people that weren't really drinking they were just kind of hanging out and he was like, well, that we want an older crowd that's going to spend money. That's okay. That's okay to uh, to, to stay the course. I got to stay the course for the first eight weeks, you know? And then if, in over eight weeks that we see that things going to need to change, then we'll change them. You know, so that was his feedback, which I thought was, all right, it was good feedback to have, and it made me felt reassured, but... Yeah, I'm like, DJ okay, am I, do- kick in. <laughs> am I doing right by the business at that point? You know what I mean? Like maybe, maybe long term I am, but short term I'm not. You know, I don't want to screw the bartenders over. And you start to think about all these little all these people that are affected by the musical choices you make. Yeah. I'm you know, see, like when you open a venue to me, I think it's more important to think long term, you know? Right. And I think I you have to give up some of the short term for long term success because if you just cater to what's going to work in the short term, you destroy your whole like business plan, you know. And I think it's yeah. important to be to to at least give the opportunity for the business plan to take action and work, you know. Yeah. And as a DJ, it, it's really hard in these situations to go against what's working in the room, right? It's really hard to have a, a dance floor and have people reacting. And even if it's a cocktail lounge where people are sitting down and people are just moving around, you could tell that their body language, they're enjoying the music to then switch to something that is not working or hasn't worked or you don't get that reaction. And it's, it's, it's kind of against everything we do as DJs, right? We're constantly looking for that feedback, that positive reinforcement. And it's really hard when you see that positive reinforcement to then do something different because it goes against everything that we're that's inside of us as DJs. Right. Yeah. I, that second set, the first set was great there. The second set was definitely a little tougher. Yeah. Um, but the, that newer places are going to evolve over time, right? Like those first few weeks of a place being open, none of those weeks are going to be what the place is. I feel long-term it's going to be a mixture of all of those weeks, right? Like you're going to, you might start with one type of crowd and end with another type of crowd or get a mixture of what the crowd was week one, two, three, and four. And that become a mixture of those four weeks of crowds becomes your, becomes your crowd moving forward. And it doesn't all, it doesn't all look the same all the time. I think there's a testament also to finding the crowd that's into you, what you're trying to do as a business. You know, if there's a certain genre that, that you you know, if your concept is around a certain style or a certain genre, it's like, you know, promote your place to those people and find your your crowd. It's the same thing as DJs, right? We say it all yeah. the time. If you want to be a tech house producer, you find your tech house people that become fans of you. You know, yeah. your crowd will find you if you're passionate about what you're doing or you go all in on what you're doing. So 
I think it's the same thing when it goes to the venues. And it's like, you'll find the people that are into the style of music that you want to play in your place. And listen, at the end of the day, again, those owners and decision makers invested a lot of money and it's their decision. And yeah. if you don't, if you don't like that or want to be in a place that, you know, where the owner is coming down and ask you to change stuff, don't play there. Yeah, it's pretty simple. <laughs> you know, I think there's a fine line for me of when I'm okay with doing that and when I'm going to be like, listen, I'm not fucking doing that. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, I, I get it. I mean, I, I think there are ways, though, too, when, it, when, when an owner is asking you to, to play a certain type of music, there are creative ways. Music's not always all black and white. There are creative ways to find things that you have that you're into that, that fits the genre being asked for, I feel. You just have, like to, there's, you there's have, a to, million... you have to, like, fool them into thinking that you're playing the genre because of the vocal right. or because exactly. of the Afrobeat or because of whatever. right. Uh, there's a certain there's a certain slickness about ex more experienced DJs that are able to do that, and that I think that's a that's a huge point of it, right? The more experienced DJ is going to fit in this open role a little better because they are a little more malleable, they are a little more um, flexible in what they're going to play, uh, and and they're more educated in the the left and right and not so much the, the the straightforward stuff. Listen, we talked about it before. There's more feathers in the cap of an experienced DJ. They've been through more. They've played more styles of rooms. They've seen everything. Then a newer DJ that maybe is getting thrown into this, and this is the first time they're opening a new room or the first time they're being asked to play a certain genre. That experience is worth something, you know? It's worth something, something for you, the DJ, that's, you know, setting your rate and it's worth something to the venue that's booking you. I think this is a great way to transition because, you know, like you said, those more experienced DJs are going to be able to do better by the venue and the owner and be able to bring more money across the bar. But in turn, I think as a venue, you need to understand that those DJs, since they are making you more money, able to keep a room and bringing more dollars across should be paid more money than the average standard DJ. Yeah. I, it's listen that whenever I'm talking to an owner and saying, Hey, this is, I, I want to raise, or this is how much money I want. If they ever, you know, kind of push back on it, I'm like, listen, just go look at the rings of when I've been there. If the rings are higher then give me the extra 150 bucks, 200 bucks, whatever it is. If they're not, or, or if you've never worked there, like check my rings compared to other DJs that play on Friday nights for the next two times I'm there. If it's higher, Show me the rings and we'll we'll make a deal, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's a good way to approach it. But you're right. But with the with having experience in these newer places is insurmountably important because you you are going to have to deal with higher ups at all times. So in dealing with the higher ups, that experience is paramount. And then also in being able to uh bend what your set looks like is is super important yeah. as well. Dealing with the higher ups is a skill in itself that takes right. a while to figure out how to how to handle. Yeah. I used to get flustered with owners when I was a DJ and they'd come ask me to do stuff or I'd get frustrated because they're asking me to do something I know wasn't gonna work. So I've been there. I understand. Gary understands. We've we've both been there. It's just over time we've realized like you have to kind of put that ego and put that anger to the side and realize it's it's for a, a bigger reason. But, but yeah, like, I think a tactic we've been using is really using uh, the DJ's experience and skill level to kind of coax out some extra dollars from some of these venues. And it's like, uh, it, it's actually been working because we, we can position certain DJs as, listen, like, this is a higher tier of DJ than your average DJ, but you're going to make more money. It's going to be a better night. And I think in positioning people that way and then having them go and DJ the room – Decision makers in the venues are realizing, wow, Cream and Gary are right. Like, we're making more money with these certain DJs. Right. And that's why it's been – it's it, that's why it's been an effective uh, strategy in, in, in trying to do this because what happens then is if the, if there's not a lot of money coming across the, the – coming across the bar, well, we're going to know that, like, you know, well, this DJ didn't really work out here as, as good as this DJ, and they're probably just checking ring. I don't know if that's 
a thousand percent all of it. I mean, it's got to be vibe of the room and ring. Of course, it's it's how but, the night goes. You know, when you're working in a room every weekend, if the vibe is good or bad, you know. Yeah, that goes into it as well. We've been lucky enough to educate ownership and management on the importance of a good DJ, and I think Dude, it's, it's been not a fucking only, fight out here, though. <laughs> it's been a fight. It's been a fight, but it hasn't. But it, it's kind of funny. We taught, we just spoke to an owner that's been in the game for like 40 years or 30, at least 30, I'm sorry, at least 30 years. And our, or my first conversation with him to the conversation we had with him last week is like night and day because he's a little more educated on what good entertainment does for his business. Has that changed in the last 30 years? I don't know. Um, what I do know is that like, the rate hasn't moved too much in 30 years. I know that for a fact. Which is crazy. I just spoke to somebody at the Orlando DJ meetup, and he and he was like, he's been DJing for 40 years. And I was like, what was the rate in 1988? He goes, 300 bucks, four hours. I was like, it's incredible to me. Incredible. Like, I mean, the rates like have baseline. gone down, if anything else. We'll, we can, we'll save this. We'll save a right, rates we'll conversation for another. But, we'll, we'll give you a whole episode on that. But it was just enlightening to hear that there's been progress in talking about the worth of the DJ and, and, and how you should approach it and look at it from ownership perspective. And I feel like we've helped with that a little bit. Um, so I, I, I think we've helped a lot with that. And I think it's part of our job as this entertainment booker and intermediary between venues and, and talent to – Make sure the talent understands the venue's expectations, but then also make sure the venue understands what you get for your money and what the difference is between a brand new DJ and Gary W. <laughs> like, right. cause there's a massive, there's a massive difference, but many times they want to pay the same number, which is insane to me. So I think positioning, like if you want the better, higher end, more experienced DJ, you have to pay more money. I can get you a DJ for $300, but it's going to be like, a DJ off the street, like your regular run of the mill DJ. If you want to get down DJ, that's, you know, we've vetted and gone through our entire process and taken our course and work with us every week. It's going to be more than that average run of the mill number. Right. And I think that positioning and, and that negotiation is, is really important and part of our jobs as get down owners. I just want to keep clear that, you know, we, when we talk about like these, these rates and stuff, it, it is, Friday, Saturday rates, mo like mostly like for your local market, right? You're when you're talking local market, you're talking Friday, Saturday rates. Cause I feel like afternoon gigs and stuff like that, th those, those rates fluctuate a little bit. Yeah. I think you and I have a different stance on some of the afternoon stuff, but I get it. it it's extra money. It's extra time. It's, 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 you know, bonus it's bonus. We only right. have so many Friday and Saturday nights. We've said that, right? So where it's, yeah, it's valuable to have this. afternoons and off nights. I get it. Yeah. All right. You know, I, I'm smiling right now from ear to ear because when Gary and I were talking about the topics today, we, you know, we brought up potentially talking about Taylor Swift. And I was like, the Swifties are going to come after us because I know you and I don't have too many amazing things to say about Taylor Swift. But <laughs> I'm, we're going to start positively. Uh, Taylor Swift ha is on her Eris tour. And her tour is estimated to bring in $1.6 billion, with a B, billion dollars. That's going to be the most insane. of all time. Which most is the most of all, all time. time. By far, the next highest was Ed Sheeran at about 750 mil. And a number of the other artists. I, I wrote down the top five. So the top five grossing tours prior to Taylor Swift and Beyonce this year, uh, Ed Sheeran, The Divide. U2 360 tour, Guns N' Roses Not In This Lifetime, The Rolling Stones, A Bigger Bang, and Coldplay, A Head Full of Dreams. And all of that was in the 2000, you know, 10 years. So 15 right. and beyond, 13 and beyond. I, Taylor Swift is, I don't, I don't particularly like her pop music. I preferred her indie, I preferred her uh, like more country and indie folk. When she came out of the indie folk, album over pandemic i i liked that i'll admit it but her pop stuff does not do it for me do i play a bunch of taylor swift absolutely i do um we have one bartender in one of our places that loves taylor swift so like every time i play 
in a room with that bartender, I play a bunch of songs. But do I find her highly annoying? A thousand percent. <laughs> this dancing shit at all the all the you know award shows and whatnot. Highly. Why that bothers me? I don't know. Should it bother me? Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. A I just find uh, it annoying. Great. But maybe it's because like you know every three seconds if. You just said Coldplay, so I'm just going to say Coldplay. Because Coldplay is, is playing on, on the stage. They keep showing Taylor Swift. It's like, why? Why Why is this appealing because to people? Because she's a megastar. I just didn't. I never understood why they would always cut back to her, and it always made me like, this is just annoying. I'm trying to watch the band that's performing on the stage. Now, what she's done with her, with her, um, with her catalog is incredible. You know, she had that separation with her, with the, um, with the record label. I forget exactly what happened. And then she re-released all of those songs and called them like, I for, I for, I should have looked this up before we talked about it. But she re-released all those songs, and I feel like it almost re brilliant, in brilliant, reinvigorated her career to the point where now she goes and tours, and we're what two years outside of that, and now she goes and tours, and it's like the biggest tour of all time by far. I mean, Beyonce is going to be close with her this this year. But, um, Beyonce's actually tour estimated well. to do over two billion on with her tour. It's in, it's it's unbelievable how powerful these two pop female artists are right now, and they've been around forever. And I think it's because they're across the spectrum of people from forty to fourteen. From gay to straight, from female to male, from no matter what it is, they yeah, translate. They're mega pop stars. They're pop they, stars because they, you know, many people like their music. I like I like the fact that I'll go back to this real quick, and then you can kind of expound a little bit. But I love the fact that Taylor Swift has been able to transcend many different genres. You know, like I said, from country to indie pop to folk to regular pop to like to dance to r&b or whatever like she's done she's done it all and she's done it all in a way that is big enough to expose mil millions upon millions of people to all of these different genres i think that's that's what's cool about her i think from a but, business standpoint and what you brought up with uh you know uh repurchasing her, the rights to her music and re-releasing it and like brilliant i love that as an artist and as someone who makes music i it's such a power move and i think it was it, it's great for the industry love it but swifties don't come after me all right don't come after <laughs> me i respect taylor swift as an artist and i respect her music i just don't care for it. it's just not my style of music i think part of it also is just the annoying requests make me dislike Taylor Swift even more because so many people come up to me and it, it's like, it's just those annoying requests that have like jaded me to even considering liking Taylor Swift as a, as an artist. Um, it's not even though it's not just the request. It's a, the way a lot of the requests are made. Uh, I'm going to make this very clear because it's very specific. I feel with certain with certain artists, it can get extremely aggressive. Like it's just play this now, do this way. now. It's entitled. Like yeah, like why do I, I'm not do not doing any of this? <laughs> right. It's 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 gotten to the point where like it's you know the bad bunny request was kind of a funny thing because like that the the phone on the forehead thing like I always found that a little amusing. You know, sure it's annoying, but it was amusing at least. But like the white entitled chick in my face, yeah, like, like the angry girl twenty one er coming yeah, up. Yeah, like. Like, you know, fuck you, you suck as a DJ, because th that's usually what will follow. You know what? This doesn't fit right now. I'm not going to play that right now. Or give me a little while. Play it right now. Fuck you, you suck. Like, if you're not going to play right now, you fucking suck. It's like, all right, I'll go to the next fucking place. Yeah. I think that's what that's what makes people not not like an artist when it gets to that point. The other thing with her music for me is, like, she never makes club tracks. She doesn't make club mu music ready for the club. They're the only way I can play her music is if it's remixed by an EDM artist. That's the only right. way that I could even consider playing it. And side note, Angelo the Kid and Olive Oil's, uh, what is it, Love Tonight or what's it called? Love Song? Um, love I'm Song, I think. Love Song, yeah. 
Angel the Kid and Olive Oil's love song is the greatest edit of all time. It's never <laughs> miss. It will work in any room, any age. It doesn't That's matter. The one with it's the, you, with it's the, the clap biggest intro, reaction right? of the night every single night. Every time I the, ever play it. The clap intro? Doesn't isn't that the one with the clap intro? I don't know not? if it has no, it doesn't have a clap intro. It's just like a big it's just a big EDM record. But like they just crushed it. It's it's really oh, good. Oh, the one the one I'm thinking of is Angelo's Wrong Side of Love, uh, Love Story. That's got the clap intro. I play that one every time. That's good. I but just yeah, you're it, right. Like Antihero Castro. Like I'm looking at all these. If, uh, there's not I knew one you were Taylor trouble, Swift Steve original spin, song that you play. There's go not edit. one or any of you as DJs listening. Antihero, Mark Anth- uh, Mark Anthony. Uh, L- Lavender Hayes, Felix John. Right, and you, if you think of Snake other ships, pop artists, you, know, you think of Dua I'm, Lipa, you think of Beyonce, you think of, I don't know, Drake. You name another pop star. Every single one of them is making music that you can play the day it's dropped. You don't have to make a remix or an edit. And right. I think that's also part of why, like, I just don't care for Taylor Swift that much. I, there's a, no- a number of the things we talked about. Yeah, when thinking about her from a DJ's perspective, it, it doesn't translate, right? So you do have to kind of dig for what's going to work. Um, but when you step outside of the DJ booth, uh, there, I'm sure there's something, it, it's probably not a whole album, but there's something that would, you'd be like, okay, that's listenable. If I wasn't a DJ, I couldn't name one Taylor Swift song. I'm a DJ and I could barely name one Taylor Swift song. I just know that's, the ones that work when I type in her name right. <laughs> <laughs> or that's uh, in my like white girl folder. Right. That's right. where all music lives. So I, she, I mean, listen, respect respect the shit out of Taylor Swift, just not my cup of tea. Yeah, we can we can hate the music and respect the person and artist and business for sure. And 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 I do. Final note. Kanye should have won that Grammy back in the day. I don't know. <laughs> I don't, like not close to me. Not close. Oh man. Now the way it was handled, it's different true. story. <laughs> music was better. The music was better. I had to throw that final jab, Gary. Yeah, I had to throw I that final you. jab. <laughs> uh, so we got to wrap it right there. Uh, that's so good. <laughs> All right. Anything we want to promote or, uh, or cover here before we finish? Mm, I don't know. One Nothing thing on that part. I'd like to bring up, uh, J- Wednesday, July 12th, we have two, two events happening. The first, uh, we're doing a boat party out of Jersey city. We're partnering with a bunch of the guys from Staten Island in New York city. We're partnering with Birch, uh, and it's going to be a really dope. Boat party on a Wednesday, leaves at 8 p.m. Uh, tickets are available. We could put the link in I'll our the link in the show, in the show notes, notes. But we got a bunch of get down DJs playing the party. Uh, UFO So, Rendeen, Timo. So if you're open format DJ, you know, want to go check out the boat, check out some, some dope DJs, uh, that's the first event. The second event, which is really invite only, but if you're interested, please hit up Gary and myself and we could talk about uh, sending you the invite link. But uh, we are partnering with the Disco Fries for their album release party slash networking event. Uh, we're providing the sound for the event, and we're going to also showcase some DJs, so really some artists. So we're showcasing uh, Solano, Dario Valley, and Sean Magda. So that'll be super dope. If you're a local, want to come check that out, shoot me or Gary a, a little DM, and we can give you some more information on it. Sounds good. All right, guys. Thanks for listening to this episode. We'll talk to you soon. Peace. Peace out.